So most of us have at least some beliefs about what constitutes a valuable life. Some people believe that an essential feature of a good life is acting in accordance with God's commands. Other people believe that an essential feature of a good life involves meeting challenges that test the limits of our capabilities. <clears throat> some other people believe actually a good life is entirely constituted by one filled with hedonic pleasure. Um, so I'm, for simplicity, going to refer to uh, things that may constitute or contribute to the intrinsic or inherent value of uh, life ideals. The question that uh, is the focus of my paper is whether there is a place for ideals in political morality. More particularly, the question is whether ideals ever serve to justify laws or political principles. There's a well-known debate in political philosophy between perfectionists and anti-perfectionists. Perfectionists answer yes to that question I just uh, posed. They uh, claim that the power of uh, the state um, may permissibly be used to promote or discourage certain ideals. Indeed, most perfectionists believe something stronger than that. They believe that political morality depends heavily on appeal to ideals. Anti-perfectionists reject that view. They argue that political morality, properly construed, requires the exclusion of ideals. Um, to simplify somewhat, anti-perfectionists believe that the power of the state should not be used to promote or discourage some ideals, but rather should be used to set up a system of rules and institutions that is fair, a system within which each person can pursue his or her own views about what constitutes a valuable life. So there are different ways to argue in favor of anti-perfectionism. And this paper is concerned with a particular kind of argument. The argument I have in mind uh, goes something like this. When deliberating or deciding about the permissible use of political power, the thought is there's something objectionably inegalitarian about relying on one's own views about how one ought to live about ideals in the face of widespread, thoughtful, uh, and sincere disagreement about ideals. Trying to shape laws or political principles to conform with my views about the good life in the face of that kind of disagreement is to behave, the thought goes, as if there's something special about me, about my beliefs. My beliefs justify laws and political principles. Your beliefs don't. Um, so I call that the equal beliefs argument for anti-perfectionism. Um, Joseph Raz and, and later uh, David Enoch have offered uh, what seems like a decisive objection for the equal beliefs argument. Um, so one of my aims in the paper is to suggest, my main aim really, is that there's a more plausible egalitarian rationale for anti-perfectionism, one that's not vulnerable to the objection that Raz and Enoch press against the equal beliefs argument. Now that has, obviously, I think, important implications. One important implication, the most obvious of which is it demonstrates that there is a plausible egalitarian argument for anti-perfectionism, something that critics of anti-perfectionism have sometimes denied. There's a second implication, one that I don't explore in this paper. Um, I think this implication is that there are certain kinds of egalitarian arguments for democratic authority, arguments that appeal to the relational nature, um, the really important relational value of equality, that don't, in fact, support democratic institutions in general, but actually provide support for a specific kind of anti-perfectionist democratic authority. But I, I don't explore that second implication in this paper. So here's a claim um, by Ronald Dworkin that is the target of Braz's uh, initial discussion, um, and it's on the handout. Dworkin says, people have a right not to suffer disadvantage in the distribution of social goods and opportunities, including disadvantage in the liberties permitted to them by the criminal law just on the ground that their officials or fellow citizens think that their opinions about the right way for them to lead their own lives are ignoble or wrong. Dworkin uh, doesn't explain why people have this alleged right, um, but the equal beliefs argument would be a way of filling the gap. Because intelligent, thoughtful people sincerely disagree about ideals, it's somehow objectionably inegalitarian for public officials or democratic majorities to use their beliefs about ideals as the basis for restricting some citizens' access to goods or liberties. 
Here's another uh, formulation of the equal beliefs argument. This, is, this time it's offered by one of the critics of the argument, uh, David Enoch. David says, the thought seems to be that if I'm willing to impose Catholicism-based imperatives on you, non-Catholic as you are, <coughs> I am giving extra political weight to my own beliefs over yours. I am treating in an asymmetric way the fact that I believe in Catholicism and the fact that you believe in its denial. According equal weight to our beliefs would require going neutral here. So here's one way to formulate the equal beliefs argument, and again, this is on the handout. Intelligent, well-meaning well people <coughs> reasoning carefully about the issues can and do disagree about ideals. In the face of such disagreement, to appeal to one's beliefs about ideals in justifying laws or political principles is to accord more weight or some kind of special weight to one's <coughs> own beliefs um, rather than beliefs of those with whom one disagrees. Uh, to do that, when, uh, to accord more weight to one's own beliefs when compared to others in those circumstances is inconsistent somehow with the moral equality of persons. Therefore, perfectionism is objectionably inegalitarian. So if that were a good argument, if that were a sound argument, that would be apparently a very powerful reason to embrace anti-perfectionism. Um, but the argument is vulnerable to a pretty decisive objection, first advanced, as far as I'm aware, by Raz. So in response to that uh, uh, statement by Dworkin, Raz says, um, and again, I think I hopefully I put this on the handout, uh, this sounds like an anti-perfectionist right, but it is not. It excludes not ideals, but the fact that people believe in them from serving as grounds for political action. So proponents of perfectionism like Raz aren't saying that anyone's beliefs in ideals justify laws or political principles. It's the ideals themselves that justify the laws or political principles. For example, it's not my belief that participating in or witnessing various forms of athletic excellence contribute to a valuable human life um, that justifies a government policy of subsidies for athletics. It's rather the fact that participating or witnessing in those forms of athletic excellence contribute to a valuable human life that justifies the subsidy. Right? My belief plays no essential justificatory role. Uh, so Enoch also makes the same objection. Enoch says, when I impose in good faith Catholicism-based directives, uh, on you, my reason for action, that is the circumstances that I take to be normatively relevant, is not that I believe uh, Catholic doctrine. Rather, my reason is the content of my belief, namely Catholic, <coughs> Catholic doctrine itself. So this objection shows, really, that the equal beliefs argument is invalid. The conclusion just doesn't follow from the premises, since perfectionism doesn't endorse one of the things described in the premises, that, namely that we can permissibly appeal to our beliefs about ideals to justify laws or political principles. It's the ideals themselves that do the heavy lifting. Um, so I'm going to call that uh, objection uh, the mistake about reasons objection. So uh, I'll, let me, before I move on to a sort of more positive proposal, I'll just uh, briefly consider a couple of possible responses uh, to the MAR objection, as I'm calling it, um, on behalf of the equal beliefs argument. These responses, uh, to give you the spoiler, don't work. Right? They are failed responses. So one response to this objection is to say, look, there's no practical difference between a political theory where ideals play a justificatory role and a political theory where people's beliefs about ideals play a justificatory role. Laws and public policies are human creations, constructions. So if we accept some version of perfectionism, it's unavoidable what's really going to happen what, uh, is that what decisively shapes laws and public policies are people's beliefs about ideals, not necessarily the ideals themselves. There's no practical difference, that's the objection. Um, I don't think this is a, a very persuasive response. Um, the response just trades or conflates <coughs> um, uh, descriptive and normative claims, right? Even if, as a matter of fact, um, it's people's beliefs about ideals um, that play a decisive role in shaping um, positive law and public policy, that has no necessary implications regarding legitimate or justifiable laws and public policies. It's open to the perfectionist to just insist that uh, public policies or laws are only justifiable or legitimate insofar as they're grounded in true or valid ideals um, about the good. Notice that an exactly analogous response would be available to someone who rejects perfectionism and endorses um, what you could call like a justice-only view, um, whereby only uh, 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 claims about justice can ground um, legitimate laws and public policies. The proponent of that view can say, look, it has no bearing 
uh, that uh, it will be real people whose beliefs about justice will shape laws and public policies. They can insist, the proponent of this justice-only view can insist that only the only legitimate laws or justifiable public policies are those that appeal to the truth about justice. Now, maybe you think that's not an appealing view of political morality, but whatever you think about that view, it doesn't allow people's beliefs about reasons for action to count as reasons for action, and neither need the perfectionist. So I don't think that response to the MAR succeeds. You might think, well, that opens the door to a, a slightly more plausible looking response to the MAR objection. The more plausible looking response is, is to sort of try and, and uh, force the proponent of this objection to confront a dilemma. So suppose a majority of voters or legislators following a constitutionally approved democratic process enact some piece of legislation on the basis of their beliefs about ideals. Um, and we can suppose that the, the, the proposed piece of legislation doesn't violate um, what we would regard as anyone's basic rights or liberties. But suppose the legislation uh, is grounded in an ideal that happens to be false. So here's the alleged dilemma for the proponent of the objection. On the one hand, the proponent can say, well, look, since the ideal is false, the state lacks the legitimate authority to impose it, despite the fact it went through the appropriate democratic procedures and no more basic rights or liberties were threatened. But that looks like a pretty significant bullet to bite. That would be to say that perfectionism is kind of radically anti-democratic, uh, that uh, democratic majorities lack the legitimate authority to pass legislation whenever the legislation is grounded in a mistaken ideal of the good life. So that's the one side of the dilemma. On the other hand, the proponent could say, OK, I concede that democratic majorities do have a legitimate authority to enact legislation on the basis of mistaken ideals. But if they make that concession, it might seem that then the objection doesn't succeed anymore. Right now, it looks like it really is the beliefs about the ideals rather than the ideals themselves that are being granted justificatory force. Um, if we assume it's not possible for false ideals to have justificatory force, that it must be the fact that people believe these ideals that's doing the lifting in legitimating the laws or policies. But if that's true, then the MAR is no longer a kind of good objection to the equal beliefs argument. Uh, Raz anticipates that worry, um, this second uh, worry, and uh, I think his response is, is persuasive. So what Raz says is, while an authority's belief that a decision is based on sound considerations makes it binding even if it is not in fact sound, the reason for this is that acknowledging the validity of an authority's decision, even if it is unsound, is in fact more likely to lead to action that is supported by sound reason than any alternative method of deciding what to do. Now there's actually a lot packed into that passage. And Raz is there relying on his particular service conception of authority to um, sort of do the work for him. But you don't need to accept Raz's service conception of authority in order to sort of endorse the more general point that he's making. The more general point I take it is something like this. If there is some authority, A, that is in general or otherwise a legitimate authority, then there are going to be reasons that are independent of any specific decision that A has made that make A a generally or otherwise legitimate authority. And so it's going to be those independent reasons. Whatever you think makes an authority potentially legitimate, <coughs> the consent of the governed, maybe Raz's service conception of authority, that explain why a particular decision A makes can be authoritative even when based on mistaken beliefs about ideals. So again, the mistaken beliefs about ideals aren't playing any fundamental justificatory role. What really justifies or legitimates the enactment of the policy is the, are, are the independent reasons that are sufficient, whatever those independent reasons are, to grant uh, officials a certain degree of authority over others. So I don't think either of these objections or responses to the MAR objection are successful. Um, so one of the proponents of the objection, uh, David Enoch, he thinks this objection is kind of pretty decisive, and he thinks it, uh, and this is a quote, shows that the equality underlying public reason, and, and for sort of the sake of simplicity, we can just uh, conflate public reason and anti-perfectionism here, is based on a simple confusion. The equality motivation, Enoch says, should just be rejected. The tension between authority and equality as understood by public reason theorists or anti-perfectionists is a pseudo-problem. That's David's view. Um, so I think we should resist that more sweeping conclusion, or I think at least we can. Um, so I agree that we should 
reject the equal beliefs argument. That doesn't look like a good argument for the reason that um, Raz and Enoch identify, but I'm uh, more optimistic that there's a different kind of egalitarian argument um, in favor of anti-perfectionism that won't be vulnerable to the MAR objection. So let's start again um, by reconsidering the initial intuition that there's something objectionably inegalitarian about using um, the power of the state to enforce or promote or discourage some ideals. What's supposed to be inegalitarian about this? Well, I agree with Raz and others. It can't be that perfectionism somehow permits people to decide on the basis of their own beliefs rather than accord uh, you know, equal weight to the beliefs of others, some kind of conciliationist position. After all, right, to insist on anti-perfectionism is also to insist, in a way, that my beliefs, if I'm an anti-perfectionist, are somehow right, and, I, and they get more weight, and opponents of anti-perfectionism have the wrong beliefs, and I'm going to, in some sense, discount them. Uh, so here's a, another quote from Raz. Raz says, yielding to consensual views, and that's, for our purposes here, something like anti-perfectionism, is not a way to avoid relying on one's own views on hard moral issues. To come to the view that one should rely on consensual principles is to come to a moral view and rely on it. Each one of us can only act for reasons we believe to justify our action. Deferring to uh, the consensus is no exception. In deferring to the judgment of others, we are still acting on our own judgment. So that should help us see, I think, that this focus, um, the focus really that Raz and, and Enoch have encouraged on whether we have to accord equal weight to the beliefs of others in certain circumstances of political disagreement is actually a red herring. I don't think that's where we should be focused. I don't think any positive account of political morality can insist we give equal weight to the views of everybody who disagrees with us. And if that were the only egalitarian argument for anti-perfectionism, then uh, perfectionists would be right to dismiss it. Instead, I think there's a different kind of egalitarian argument um, that's more plausibly construed as appealing to a certain way that um, distributions and relationships, egalitarian distributions and relationships, can be sustained under uh, circumstances of uh, foundational disagreement about ideals. So by foundational disagreements, I mean something like this. Um, foundational disagreements are characterized by the fact that the parties to the disagreement don't share a deeper standard of justification that can serve in some way to adjudicate the dispute that they're having. So suppose that you and I disagree about the permissibility of premarital sex. You believe uh, it's permissible and I do not. Suppose that disagreement arises from a deeper fact or a further fact that I believe moral permissibility is determined by God's commands, whereas you are a rural utilitarian. Um, these kind of disagreements happen all the time. Right? We lack a shared justificatory framework to resolve our first order dispute about premarital sex. And so in my sense, it's a, it's a foundational dispute. So although the foundational disagreement I just gave you is sort of uh, slightly oddly philosophical and maybe not that common, foundational disagreements about ideals actually are really common. Um, and they threaten to make uh, sort of uh, mutually advantageous forms of social cooperation pretty difficult or even impossible. Political institutions and rules are the obvious solution to those kinds of disagreements um, because they can serve as an impartial uh, framework in which those disagreements get resolved. I want to draw your attention to two features that I think are important when we think about um, these political institutions uh, that serve to somehow adjudicate or uh, deal with these disagreements. So the first feature is that the institutions um, have to be impartial in a particular sense. They mustn't be mere instruments of one party to the conflict. If they are, they sort of fail to be impartial. Um, so to illustrate, again, suppose you and I are locked in one of these foundational disagreements, and to resolve the disagreement, I propose uh, I nominate a third party that will serve as the adjudicator, that will resolve our disagreement, and the person I nominate is Fezzik, who's way bigger and stronger than either of us. Um, but Fezzik is my employee, and uh, he's uh, sort of simple-minded and thus certain to enforce my views of the matter. Um, and so, in that context, nominating Fezzik as the impartial adjudicator, that's just a sham, right? Fezzik is just an instrument of my side in the conflict. Now, that's not a positive account of what impartiality requires, but I'm suggesting it's one necessary feature. 
what uh, impartial institutions have to look like, is that they mustn't be mere instruments in service of one side of the conflict. <clears throat> the second feature of these institutions that I want to highlight is that they yield rules or norms um, to which individuals uh, normally have to accord deliberative priority. Um, so in order for these governing institutions to function effectively, um, at least in large, complicated societies, um, the people who are governed by those institutions most of the time have to accept that the rules issued by those institutions have a certain priority over other considerations, in particular over uh, considerations uh, that they might regard as uh, generating the disagreement in the first place. Right? If nobody's willing to accept the judgment of an arbiter, then the arbiter isn't much use. So there are lots of ways in which we have to give priority to the rules issued by governing institutions. Uh, one really important way uh, that that happens is in accepting something like the right to do wrong. So by that I mean that A, person A, will have a claim right against interference when buying, despite the fact that, at least from some other person B's perspective, buying is morally wrong. Right? B is under a duty to refrain from A's buying, and B is expected to accord that duty deliberative priority over her other considerations most obviously her belief that fine is morally wrong. So my thought is not complicated, it's just that a plausible account of governing institutions should have some plausible explanation of why individuals should accord deliberative priority to the rules issued by those governing institutions over these important convictions that they have. So those are just two features I wanted to identify. I now want to think about whether there's a distinctively egalitarian reason to prefer certain forms of self-government over others. And I think it might help to uh, step back from the political case um, and consider a smaller scale example. Um, so suppose, stretch yourself, and suppose that you are a member of a philosophy department um, with uh, some fairly deep and sharp disagreements. So in your department, some people are Platonists, and some people are Humeans, and some people are Kantians. Um, but these, the differences between you and your colleagues are really sharp and really deep. These aren't nice, sort of cheery disagreements. Um, uh, many of the faculty members in your department think there's little, maybe no value, in the sort of work that their colleagues are doing. Indeed, much of what their colleagues are doing, you know, what these Kantians are doing is just pernicious and counterproductive to good philosophy. I can see Rafe is grinning in agreement. <laughs> but despite these deep and sharp differences, um, the department strives to operate as a community of equals, where everyone shares, in some sense, equally in the governance of the department, um, and burdens and benefits are otherwise shared in some kind of equitable manner. And there's lots of decisions that your department is going to have to make, right? You have to decide who's going to be head of department, which graduate students to admit, how to allocate administrative burdens, who's going to have authority over the syllabus, right? which job candidates to hire. So without a reasonably clear set of rules or principles to govern those kinds of decisions, the department's not going to function effectively. Right? Each faculty member has to accord the rules a kind of deliberative priority over their more substantive convictions about philosophy. Um, now think about how the rules in your department get justified. Suppose, for example, that the rules are justified by assuming that Hume and only Hume's view of philosophy is sort of correct in all its details, right? And that the Platonic and Kantian views are completely mistaken. So the rules issue judgments like job candidates whose work is inconsistent with the Humean tradition are going to be rejected. The content of syllabi are rejected unless they reflect the appropriate Humean view of the topic and so on. These are the rules to which each faculty member has to give deliberative priority. Um, so in a department like that, setting aside the fact that we think it's probably not going to work very, very long, <laughs> very effectively for very long, set that worry aside. Right? In a department like that, some faculty members have to subordinate their central convictions about the nature of philosophy to those of their colleagues. And as a result of that fact, my suggestion is the department in one way fails to be a community of equals. The rules and decisions are needed in part because of the deep philosophical disagreements amongst the faculty members. But if the justification for the rules presupposes one of the contested philosophical traditions, then the rules aren't resolving the disagreement in a way that reflects <coughs> the equality of the faculty members. Rather, my suggestion is the rules are kind of serving as an instrument to impose one of the contested doctrines on those who dissent. 
So now think about something in the example I've just given you that was left unclear. How was it determined that the rules of the department were going to be justified by assuming the correctness of Hume's view? Um, more specifically, does it matter whether that decision was taken democratically by, say, a, major a majority vote? So some Democrats might think, well, look, that matters a lot. If uh, the department's rules, uh, and the, or rather the justification for the department's rules, was voted on and a majority chose to sort of endorse this kind of purely Humean view, um, then there's no problem. The department really is uh, sufficiently egalitarian in all the ways that we might have reason to care about. Um, but I think that conclusion is false, and it's easy to see that it's false once we step back and reflect on the fact that majoritarian uh, decision procedures are just one apparently egalitarian way of resolving disputes, and there are often other egalitarian ways of resolving collective disputes. So a different example just for a second. Suppose there's a group of friends who go out for dinner um, once a month, um, and, but the friends are divided regarding what sort of meal they prefer. So uh, a stable majority always prefers to eat at an Italian restaurant, a stable minority always prefers to eat at a Japanese restaurant, and a further stable minority always prefers to eat at a Chinese restaurant. Um, so two procedures are proposed to resolve this problem. Uh, one procedure is, look, each month we should just take a vote by majority and decide which restaurant to go to. Um, that's procedure A. Procedure B is, well, we should rotate between the three restaurants in proportion to the, uh, sort of the preferences of the members of our friendship group. Now we have to choose between those two decision procedures. And so the majority, realizing kind of what's at stake, uh, decides, well, we're going to use majority rule to choose decision procedure A, where we use majority rule to vote each month, knowing that that means we'll just always go to an Italian restaurant and we'll never go to the other restaurants. So I think it looks like something objectionably inegalitarian has happened there. Um, the plausible explanation of that intuition is that there's a particular good or advantage that's at issue here, which is something like the satisfaction of people's culinary preferences. And the policy in this case of choosing by majority rule ensures that some people receive as much of that good as possible, whereas others receive none of it at all. Now maybe that's not objectionably inegalitarian if no other feasible distribution of the good you know, was, was on offer, but that's not the case, right? Um, by hypothesis, we got an alternative distribution where the culinary preferences could be distributed in a more kind of equitable way. And so in light of that alternative, to insist on majority rule is not a way of kind of showing due respect for the equal standing of the members of the group. It's rather a way of subverting equality. That's my suggestion. Now, of course, right, there's lots of disanalogies between the restaurant case and the cases that are of more interest to us. But my point here is pretty modest. It's just we can't take for granted that the fact a self-governing group <coughs> made a majoritarian decision, that's not sufficient to conclude that the uh, justifications that follow are suitably egalitarian. Okay, so let's go back to the deeply divided philosophy department. There's profound disagreement in this department about how philosophy ought to be done, about which traditions are valuable, and which are useful or counterproductive. My thought was, it's largely because of that kind of disagreement that in order for the department to function effectively, there need to be rules to which each faculty member accords deliberative priority. But if those rules presuppose the correctness of one of the philosophical traditions, some people are just being required to subordinate their essential convictions about philosophy, and other people are not being so required. So when a non-Humean faculty member asks herself, look, why should I accord deliberative priority to this rule about the syllabus or job candidates? The thought is she's kind of given no additional justification for doing so, other than the one that her Humean colleagues have been offering since the beginning, namely, our view is right and your view is wrong. So there's, she's not given a reason that transcends the initial disagreement. Now sometimes, right, maybe that's okay. When no other decision procedure is feasible, right, maybe the, the sole fact that we are a majority and you are a minority is a sufficient reason for her to accord deliberative priority to those rules. But when a different set of institutions or a different decision, feasible, uh, decision procedure is feasible and also offers a more kind of egalitarian distribution uh, or protection of a central interest, one that's at the heart of the dispute, then I'm saying there is no reason, um, that, uh, adequate reason that's given to accord deliberative priority to these rules. 
So the assumption um, that's kind of underlying the, the uh, rough proposal here is, uh, I guess, that it's plausible to think that each faculty member in this example has a significant interest in not being required to subordinate her central convictions about philosophy to alternative positions. But in the department we've been imagining, the rules and institutions are designed to guarantee that that interest is not going to be equally protected. Some faculty members have that interest perfectly protected. They never have to subordinate their central judgments, whereas other people don't have that interest protected really at all. But we can imagine, don't worry, right? we can imagine a different version of the department, one um, where the rules and principles are justified in a way that doesn't presuppose the correctness of one of the, of the philosophical traditions, but rather are justified by appeal to certain values or ideals that all members of the department share, maybe the ideal of faculty autonomy regarding the content of syllabi, or the relative unimportance of job talks when making hiring decisions. If the department's rules and institutions were justified in that way, then no faculty member would be required to subordinate her central convictions about philosophy to those of others, and so there'd be one important sense in which the faculty members stand as equals in the shared governance of their department that they don't do in the original version of the example. So, I've been uh, focused on this deeply divided philosophy department, um, but obviously I'm hoping the conclusion applies more broadly, um, it, 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 and applies in particular to political communities. In fact, I think the egalitarian rationale I've been sketching um, is uh, sort of uniquely important when we think about political communities for at least two reasons. There may be many reasons, but here are two. Right? First, each individual person has uh, a really important interest in not subordinating her central convictions about ideals. I think that interest is more important than the interest a philosophy faculty member has in not subordinating her judgments regarding foundational issues in philosophy. Second, and um, more importantly, I believe that the primary function of political communities is to implement and preserve just institutions. Um, if, as many people believe, uh, justice has a very special kind of priority in our practical reasoning, if it's rarely uh, permissible uh, to prioritize other considerations over the requirements of justice, and if a political community, as I believe, its central purpose is to implement and preserve just institutions, then the egalitarian rationale I've been sketching has particular salience when we think about the relationship amongst um, members of a political community. Other self-governing communities, like our uh, department, may issue directives to which we often have to give priority, but reasonably just political communities might be unique in issuing directives where we're almost always required to give those directives deliberative priority. So on the handout is a summary of what I'm calling the subordination argument. There are a series of steps. Self-governing communities characterized by a certain form of disagreement require impartial rules and institutions uh, to regulate individual behavior. And for those rules and institutions to be effective, individuals have to typically accord those rules and institutions deliberative priority. Persons have an important interest in not being required to subordinate their judgments about fundamental matters, providing the judgments are compatible with the protection of the same important interests of others. When institutional arrangements are feasible, when different institutional arrangements are feasible, sorry, there's a pro tanto egalitarian reason to choose the arrangement that offers the most equal protection of the interest described in seven. Anti-perfectionist political institutions offer more equal protection of the interest described in seven than perfectionist political institutions, and so we get the conclusion that there's an egalitarian reason to favor anti-perfectionism in the self-governing <coughs> communities characterized by a certain form of disagreement. So let me um, conclude by uh, addressing uh, sort of a bunch of objections to this argument. So first objection, and you might think this is kind of an obvious one and it's been frustrating you listening to me. Get to the objection. <laughs> so obvious. Your argument is vulnerable to the MAR objection, just like the equal beliefs argument was vulnerable to the MAR objection. You're suggesting that in some contexts uh, where uh, we're required to afford <coughs> deliberative priority to what we regard as the false views of others, this can be objectionably inegalitarian. <coughs> But the skeptic, the objector says, perfectionism doesn't require anybody to accord deliberative priority to the beliefs of others. It requires you to accord deliberative priority to the content of those beliefs. It's the substantive content, not the beliefs, or the fact that people believe them, that matters. And so once you recognize that, the subordination argument just dissolves. Um, 
in, in the face of a version of the MAR objection. So the objection doesn't succeed against the subordination argument, and the reason it doesn't succeed is that the subordination argument, as I've sketched, doesn't posit an interest in not being required to subordinate one's judgments about important matters to others' beliefs. Rather, the interest being posited is just uh, one that uh, uh, doesn't uh, require you to subordinate your judgments about fundamental matters full stop. Right? In other words, the interest is threatened even when you're required to subordinate your central convictions to the truth. So you might think, okay, well, if you're going to construe the interest that way, maybe you avoid the MAR objection, but now uh, the, in, the egalitarian rationale is just implausible. There's nothing objectionably inegalitarian about being required to subordinate your judgments to the truth. Um, I don't think that's so. Um, so here's an example um, from uh, Dave Heslin. Uh, the example says, assume Catholicism is true, assume the Pope has infallible access to God's commands. Now think about a political community where non-Catholics are required to subordinate their judgments about religion and the good life to those of the Pope. I think that community is, whatever you might think uh, about it, all things considered, it is objectionably inegalitarian. Uh, and we can explain why it is um, without needing to appeal to the equal beliefs argument. It looks objectionably inegalitarian because each person has this interest in not being required to subordinate her judgments about fundamental matters. And in the imagined society, this interest isn't equally protected. The interests of non-Catholics are thwarted, whereas the interests of Catholics are not. A different objection, but one that arises uh, as sort of maybe in response to the rejoinder I just gave, is, is that uh, is to say equality isn't really doing any of the heavy lifting here. Um, whatever you might think is objectionable in cases like the Catholic case I just gave you, equality isn't relevant to the explanation. We can explain what's morally troubling about these cases insofar as you think something's morally troubling about them by appeal to some view of autonomy or some ideal of freedom of conscience, some view about liberty, right? Equality is just not playing any interesting role here. That's an objection that Enoch makes. Um, about about <coughs> Asian tradition in general. I don't think that that, sound, that doesn't sound right to me. Um, so compare two political communities now, while holding the assumption that uh, uh, holding constant the assumption that Catholicism is true. So in the first community, assume there are no Catholics, but everyone is somehow required to subordinate their convictions um, to Catholic doctrine. In the second society, or second community, there are some Catholics, there are some non-Catholics, and everyone is required to subordinate their judgments to Catholic doctrine. I think the second society, the non-homogenous one, right, has an additional moral problem, or bad-making feature, um, that is absent in the first case. Indeed, I think something stronger, although I don't need the stronger claim, I think the second society seems worse to me, holding everything else equal. The subordination argument offers a clear and plausible explanation of that intuition. The skeptic who denies that equality is playing any interesting role in explaining what's morally troublesome about cases like this just can't reach that intuitive verdict. In fact, the skeptic might be committed to what looks pretty plausible to me, a conclusion namely that the first society um, is actually worse than the second, since there is less total autonomy or freedom in the first society when compared to the second. Um, all right, different objection now. Uh, you might think, look, li liberal, in liberal democratic societies, neo-Nazis and racists and other kinds of religious extremists are required to accord deliberative priority to laws that are justified by appeal to fundamental values that they find um, to be false. But we don't, or at least I don't, and I hope many of you don't find that to be objectionably inegalitarian. That just doesn't look even pro or troubling. But doesn't the subordination argument implausibly entail that it is um, objectionably inegalitarian? So again, I think we can meet this objection. Um, the subordination argument doesn't require the strong assumption that each person has an interest uh, against being required to subordinate her judgment uh, regarding fundamental matters, regardless of what the content of those judgments are. Rather, the argument, as I was imagining it, depends on a more modest assumption that each person has an interest against being required to subordinate her judgments regarding fundamental matters, provided the content of those judgments is compatible with the protection of a similar interest for others. 
So there's a, a kind of reciprocity uh, condition built in. So people who endorse kind of deeply illiberal doctrines have fundamental judgments whose content isn't compatible with the protection of other people's interests in not being subordinated. So no legitimate interest of theirs is thwarted when they're required um, uh, to respect the basic liberal rights and freedoms of others. That restriction of the scope of the argument, um, or the scope of the relevant interest, I think it's plausible and it's not ad hoc. It's valuable and important that people should be able to live in accordance with the dictates of their conscience. They shouldn't have to subordinate their judgments about certain fundamental matters. But that value isn't unrestricted. Right? Nothing of value is lost, I think, when violent racists are prevented from living in accordance with their deepest convictions. The response I just gave to that objection might invite a, a sort of more nuanced version of the objection. I think, look, even if we exclude uh, obviously illiberal doctrines from the scope of the argument, um, there's still lots of very deep disagreements between citizens concerning matters of justice rather than ideals of the good. And if there's an interest in not being required to subordinate uh, your judgments about fundamental matters, doesn't that implausibly entail that every time a political community decides a matter of justice in one way rather than another way, um, that's objectionably inegalitarian, since the people who lose out are being required to subordinate their judgments to the majority. Um, so this objection, the one I just described, is a version of, of what I call the asymmetry objection to political liberalism more generally. Um, Anti-perfectionists um, uh, or political liberals claim political morality has to eschew appeals to ideals of the good because reasonable people disagree about the good, but the critics point out Opponents of the asymmetry objection point out, look, reasonable people disagree about matters of justice, too, yet political liberals don't seem so worried about that. They're happy to allow um, a controversial views about justice to play a justificatory role, and that looks like an indefensible asymmetry. Um, so I tried to respond to the asymmetry objection in other work, and I'm not going to sort of rehearse the full response. I don't think this objection succeeds against the subordination argument um, that I've been sketching. Okay? The thought is, once <coughs> illiberal doctrines are excluded from the constituency of concern, the remaining disagreements about justice occur between people who share certain fundamental convictions about the moral status of persons. Um, and those fundamental convictions, say that people are free and equal, serve as a justificatory framework within which the disagreements about justice can take place. And since they take place within a shared justificatory framework, the views about justice that don't prevail after a fair democratic process, um, the people who have those views, they're not required to subordinate their central convictions to alternative doctrines they simply regard as false. Rather, what's going on is they're required to subordinate their judgments about an interpretation of a shared set of values to an alternative interpretation that they can recognize as plausible or reasonable. So this is just an assertion, right? My thought is subordinating one's views about foundational disagreements is kind of deeply problematic or alienating in a way that subordinating your judgments about how best to interpret or develop shared values isn't. Um, I don't think we have the same kind of reasons for concern in the latter case that we do in the former. Last objection. Even if you accepted that the subordination argument was successful. You thought, yeah, that looks like a good argument. Um, you might think, but the conclusion is just too modest. Uh, all the conclusion establishes is that there's an egalitarian reason to favor anti-perfectionism. But that reason might just not look very weighty when compared to the reasons in favor of perfectionism. Right? Who cares about equality um, when individual flourishing is at stake? Um, if ideals about the good are precluded from playing a justificatory role, the state can't ensure that citizens lead more rather than less valuable lives. Why disable the state from achieving that function for the sake of a particular kind of equality, particularly when we might think, well, there are other valuable dimensions of equality that will still get satisfied under a perfectionist state? Two points quickly in response to this last objection. The first point is, I think the objection assumes that if the state is precluded from aiming at improving the quality of or the value of citizens' lives, then citizens will, in fact, lead less valuable lives. Um, but that's an empirical assumption and one that I think we should be deeply skeptical of. Our experience <coughs> suggests we should be very wary of the assumption that the state has 
uh, the effective ability and can be trusted to aim at improving the value of individuals' lives, according to some perfectionist ideal. The second response is just concessive. I agree, right? I haven't shown that um, the subordination uh, argument provides any kind of decisive reason to favor anti-perfectionism, and that's not what I was trying to do. Uh, my aim was really modest, um, uh, which was just to show here's an egalitarian rationale, here's an egalitarian reason for the exclusion of ideals that isn't vulnerable to the mistake about reason's objection that Raz um, and Enoch and others have advanced. <laughs>